the subcommittee of the whole on supply resumes. Um, I think, uh, yes, the minister is going to respond to the honorable member from Dartmouth South. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, to the member opposite, I apologize. This is why I asked for the clock at the beginning. I, I, I honestly didn't realize that the clock was running out. Um, so looking at the, the, the conversation, I don't know if I remember the specific uh, detail of the question, but uh, in essence of round funding towards uh, Elizabeth Fry, uh, as it relates to the housing initiative that uh, took place uh, during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, so I guess the, the context around that um, initiative when it took place, I think is relevant to, to where we're at kind of now. And uh, that initiative as it uh, took place was a, a specifically a, around the COVID response and what was going on at that time. It was multi-departmental uh, and it uh, did rely on um, not infrastructure at Elizabeth Fry, but uh, I believe in, in uh, hotel-based uh, uh, environments and space. So uh, I think there are a, a multitude of, of factors when uh, you know the funding for that uh, wrapped up. Uh, obviously, the pandemic uh, status and the epidemiology and so forth all has evolved uh, as well. And uh, so as the multiple departments looked and evaluated uh, and, and, and came up with some decisions, what the decision actually was, uh, was not uh, simply a, a no, but rather a an acknowledgement of um, how there, there, there may be uh, value in, in these types of uh, services on a go forward basis. But if we're going to look at them on an on forward uh, on a go forward basis, uh, we need to look at them in a sustainable way and not simply in um, in a short term uh context so uh work is 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 uh, i think uh, still uh, evaluating looking at uh, that and as, as we do with lots of other services and, and programs that we're trying to uh, accomplish as i said earlier uh, it's not just uh, about and, and many people assume that our justice system is about punishment you know the, the whole uh, theory of crime and punishment and in fact that's not what modern justice is about uh, that justice is about uh, more than that, and, and indeed uh, rehabilitation and, and reintegration into society, uh, we, our ultimate goal is, is to have people. So uh, as I've said, uh, and, and, and I think there might be a, a little differentiation on, on the funding, uh, um, I think uh, the department uh, believes that there was an increase in funding, uh, although some of it pulls it together. I believe there's an increase to allow for an increase in the number of beds from, uh, I believe it was about eight to 10 or 11 beds. So I mean, if you do that on a per bed capacity, that you're looking at a 20, 30 percent increase uh, that 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 went to. So uh, again, uh, I think the in in the main chamber, the speaker would uh, argue that perhaps we have a disagreement of fact uh, here in terms of the interpretation of that funding. Um, but it's also important that uh, how this conversation takes place too is, I think, because there are so many funding sources, and I think uh, the member uh, actually highlighted, and I thank her for highlighting that that because it's something I personally am, am passionate about, especially from, from previous departments where we have lots of community organizations that we're funding, is streamlining the funding process um, because the administrative burden uh, actually uh, for the people who are doing the great work that we rely on them to do in community and these community organizations, and this isn't just a justice, I think this is, is more broad than that, uh, if we can take down some of those barriers and 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 get more sustainable and uh, and that's why back to the specific question we're so focused on looking at what the sustainable solution to the policy objective we're pursuing is so i think there's a certain degree of of um agreement on the policy in principle timing and specifics is where we're perhaps at a di different point at this point in time thank you minister before i recognize the honorable member from Dartmouth South. I'm wondering if the uh, Ms. Lorna Scroft would mind taking over as chair. I have a few questions I want to ask in the main chamber. Uh, the member from Dartmouth South goes until 3.38, and then that, that will be turned over to the member from Fur Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River, and the next break is at 3.50, but I should be back before then. Millbrook, Salmon Pearl Salmon River? Pearl, Pearl Bible Hill, Millbrook Salmon River. <laughs> Actually, Mr. Speaker, it's going to be uh, the member from Inverness. Oh, 
Okay, there it could be the member from Inverness. I'm sorry. At 338. Uh, yes, and I apologize to the member from Dartmouth South. I'll let you ask your question now and Ms. Lawrence Thank Krause you. will take over. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I guess just to reiterate the question that I was asking before the break, um, and I see the former minister here who will be very familiar with my pestering as it relates to um, funding for Elizabeth Brown and Holly House. But um, just to reiterate, my question was about that sustainable conversation that you once again alluded to at the very end of your remarks. What does that look like? Who are you talking to? Is the province considering a community based bail program? Who's at the table? Who are you talking to briefly, if possible? Because I'd like to move on to some other things. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, my specific comments when I. The Honorable Minister. Madam Chair. Um, yes, my, my specific comment was in reference to my personal mindset and, and approach and, and desires. Uh, I've only been in uh, for, for a couple of months, uh, so I, I can't say that I've initiated or taken steps down that, that path. I was talking more broadly okay. uh, in, in, in conceptually how I try to operate and, and try to streamline uh, because I think it is advantageous for our partners, but also for our organization as well. Uh, and, and government proper. So uh, it is uh, something uh, I've, I've been passionate about and I, I did have some success uh, at the Department of Health in, in streamlining some of that work uh, there. It's not perfect, but I, I, I continuous improvement. The member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess just, um, I have one more question in this area, but I would say, I think as I said before the break, I know that there are conversations going on in corrections around a provincial bail program. The last I heard, there were no women serving organizations at that table. My hope would be um, that if they're not already, that they could be. Um, and so we often see in lots of our provincial departments that we, in, in the world, that we design things around men and then we adapt them to women. And I am hoping that we don't do that here. So we are hoping that we can come up with a streamlined, clear, compassionate community bail program for provincial jails, and that that can happen collaboratively with the most diverse group of stakeholders. But moving on, I just want to flag for the minister, um, I'm guessing you don't have a response, but but if the minister does, that's great, that we've discovered recently that the, the Metro Regional Housing Authority, and I'm not sure about the rest of Housing Nova Scotia, but for MRHA, um, they, their guidelines say that tenants shall not use their unit for the purposes of meeting bail conditions, house arrests, other legal proceedings without prior written permission of the property manager. As you can imagine, that permission is rarely granted. Um, Placing those kind of barriers means that our provincial jails become homeless shelters. And if you talk to a lot of folks who are working on the front lines, they will say that this is happening, even people within corrections, because given the housing shortage, given these restrictive conditions on public housing, um, people have nowhere to go. And so even if they have been arrested for a relatively minor infraction and are waiting trial, and we know there are delays, they can't get out. Um, and so I'm wondering if the minister could briefly comment on whether he's had a conversation with his colleagues in housing or, or if he could. Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, at this point, uh, again, as the member knows, we've been uh, quite busy the last uh, month or so since we've transitioned on uh, budget uh, and legislative uh, duty. So um, that I haven't had uh, conversations specifically or directly with uh, my colleague. Um, but uh, yes, there, there are obviously, as I have mentioned in our previous conversation, uh, about uh, broadly speaking, from a ju justice perspective, uh, housing, it's something we became you know, particularly acutely aware during the uh, COVID pandemic, particularly in the first wave. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, obviously, as I've said, something we are working on as government, uh, and, and we're trying to tackle and pull down uh, barriers in services that cross multiple departments. So uh, those types of conversations, I think, happen at the staff and ministerial level, uh, perhaps, uh, I, honestly, I would say more seamlessly today than they did even seven years ago, eight years ago, when I when I first came into government. And 
also uh, work with um, corrections and uh, the housing commission as, as well. Um, and, and again, having these conversations. But again, uh, we really started this work uh, about a year ago in the short-term context of a COVID response. But mm -hmm. what we learned from that and took from that was, was the need. So again, on the scheme of things, it's relatively new, but, but, but work ongoing. Yeah. I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thanks. And, and I want to just take a moment to thank your staff. This is a strange estimates period because usually we see everyone in the room, but, but we only have a window to the minister. So thank you to all the department staff who are there and tuning in. Um, I want to ask um, something related to uh, a bill that we brought in, but also an issue that we've heard a lot about, which is the fact that our Municipal Elections Act does not permit incarcerated people to vote, which is in direct contravention of the Supreme Court of Canada. So the Supreme Court of Canada ruled in 2002 that not giving incarcerated people the right to vote was a violation of their charter rights, provided they're 18 years and older. But our Municipal Election Act uh, doesn't permit that. It's an easy legislative fix. It's one we've asked for. That act has been opened up in the last couple of years and that fix was not made. And so I'm wondering if the minister can tell us why and if and when the department intends to make that fix. Minister? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, well, uh, as the, the member noted was a question pertaining to uh, Municipal uh, Elections Act. I believe that act falls under the municipal uh, affairs. Uh, it's not the Nova Scotia Elections Act that falls under uh, my purview and, and Elections Nova Scotia. The member well, we for Dartmouth South. Well, I see the Minister of, of Municipal Affairs here on the line. So we'll hopefully he'll have time to to do some preparation and to answer that question. But, you know, of course, the Department of Justice, your Department of Justice would provide a legal opinion on that. Um, I'm assuming that opinion would be in line with the Supreme Court of Canada. So we would hope to see a change there. In particular, I just want to note that, you know, this government is making a commitment to equity. And, you know, hopefully we'll have time to get into later the disproportionate um, makeup of the folks in prison, but we know that they are tend to, you know, Indigenous and Black uh, people tend to be very overrepresented in those environments. And so this is an equity issue as much as it's a charter issue. Um, and to that end, I just want to again raise the issue of the video that was released um, a couple of weeks ago from Burnside that appears to have been taken by a, a correction staff there ridiculing an inmate um, who has their medical for medical needs and and clearly identifying that that woman and when i asked about this um i was told that there will be an investigation and so i'm going to ask the minister again if the results of that investigation will be made public so that we can deal with the kind of underlying systemic issues that allow something like that to happen minister Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, I think uh, this is a particular uh, circumstance that um, is perhaps more complex than, than what it might appear on the surface when it comes to investigating and, and so forth um, uh, to the specific question of, of um, information that gets released uh, as part of the report. Uh, this is a unionized environment, so there are aspects uh, that uh, tie us in and around uh, workplace and, 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 and workplace issues and, and, and so forth uh, that, that trigger, again, privacy and, and things in, in that context. Obviously, there's uh, privacy, uh, certainly as, as it relates to individuals in the video and uh, and beyond and how things transpired. Uh, and we know that the uh, Privacy Office has initiated an independent uh, review from that privacy lens there. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there just there are a lot of complexities. So uh, I can't uh, comment now as to whether the uh, substance in part or in full get uh, released publicly. Uh, until I see what the, the final results uh, of, a, of a report are, because uh, anything that gets released publicly, what I have to say is that, that it has to adhere to uh, those privacy components as well and, and other legislation that may 
uh, be in place here. So I can't, uh, I know it's what, what the member wants, but I can't blanket say uh, that the, the investigation report will be blanket released. What I can say, and I think my, my track record shows when I've uh, in other departments had uh, reviews and stuff, uh, I do make information as, as best I can uh, be um, be uh, implemented and uh, and that work uh, you know, at, at minimum information of, about uh, the report and findings, but uh, I can't say that the report itself is released because of all those other privacy things that might override such a thing, and I don't know the answer to that until I see the actual report. Um, I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that answer. Uh, certainly, we will be making the same request of the union, uh, and we would not want to violate anyone's privacy, but but we want to learn from what happened. And while it is an isolated incident, incident it also reflects, we believe, um, some pretty serious systemic issues. So, so I will take the minister at his word that you know what is able to be shared will be shared, not just with us, but with kind of relevant um, front-facing organizations who kind of can help to unpack and untangle and fix hopefully some of those systemic issues. I, I just want to go back. Um, we were talking earlier about the number of people uh, in our provincial jails, particularly in Burnside, which you know borders my constituency. It's in Dartmouth North, um, who are on remand. And I wonder if the minister can provide an update of the percentage of people in provincial jails currently who are there on remand, awaiting trial, not convicted. Minister, I'd just like to let you know that you can take some time to think about the, your response. You don't have to. It's a little different where you normally would stand up and then the, 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 you would be recognized. So please feel comfortable taking a little bit of time. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, I think uh, most of the colleagues on here would suggest that I take lots of time in my response. So I try to be efficient in, in getting to the microphone. <laughs> So, I understand. <laughs> not, notwithstanding, notwithstanding that point, um, the member's question, Madam Chair, was uh, the number of uh, people in uh, in uh, custody. So in I, I know the specific question was in was remand. Is yeah. uh, in custody is three hundred and seventy seven. 276 are on remand. So uh, I didn't do the math. I know I think the question was the percentage. Uh, I hope the member can uh, do the division. I just didn't do the percentage. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Well, I'm going to take a page out of my colleague from Dartmouth North's uh, playbook here, and I'm going to divide 276 by 377, and I'm going to get to 73%. So 73% of the people in our provincial correctional facilities um, have not been convicted of a crime. And, you know, we know anecdotally uh, that lots of those folks are there for a breach or, you know, some, what we, what most people would consider minor. Uh, so we are hopeful that that number will decrease um, and that, you know, there will be an opportunity for people to, you know, to the minister's point. Um, I think the aspiration is certainly for the correctional um, environment to be rehabilitative. Um, but we've got a long way to go. That is not the experience uh, of the vast majority of people who find themselves there. And so until we can either uh, radically change our system or, or create the kind of aspirational situation that the minister is referring to, I think our best hope is um, for some kind of community-based release situation where the public is safe, where people are safe, where they have access to the services they need. We know that, you know, particularly when we're talking about criminalized women, most of them, the vast majority of them are survivors of trauma and abuse um, and need wraparound supports. And it is rare that they can get those supports in the full measure when they are in fact incarcerated. So um, hopefully that percentage goes down. Uh, I want to move on. Um, to a couple questions about policing. Um, we're all in the COVID time warp, but sometime in the last couple of years, um, 
we uh, we were pleased to see uh, the government change the time frame, and I think the minister referred to this in his opening comments uh, to synchronize the complaint time between the RCMP um, and police, particularly because we have these joint forces. Um, and this was in response, of course, to the case of Carrie Lowe, who went public after she couldn't bring a complaint, and and it became very difficult. Um, we had put in a legislative proposal around this, and, and so we were really glad to see the government bring it in. But one part of our legislative proposal that didn't, that where the change wasn't made, was around the issue of discoverability. So we have a discoverability act, which basically means all those time frames that run, and I don't, I'm not explaining this to the minister, I'm just saying this as part of my question, but the time frames that run um, you know, in most statutes in Nova Scotia run from the time that, that the issue was discovered. But that is not the case in the Police Act. In the Police Act, it runs from the time that the incident occurred. And the problem with that is for someone like Carrie Lowe, she did not know that there was a miscarriage of justice until after such time as her limitation period would have elapsed. And so one of our requests was to add the principle of discoverability into the police act. So the timeframes have been synchronized and that's good, that's a positive change, but those timeframes should run from the time when a person um, who feels themselves to have been wronged uh, is, is alerted of that. Because often, I mean, I don't, just from my own limited dealings with law enforcement, like if you have an issue and you contact law enforcement, then the response, which is justified in lots of circumstances, is let me take that away and we're going to look into it and we're going to investigate and we'll keep you apprised as needed. So, so you know, as, 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 a, as a complainant, you don't have a window into what's happening in your case. And so if there is a miscarriage, it may be a long time before you discover that. So it's a long preamble, but but I wonder if the minister can comment on whether that change is still being contemplated, um, and if not, why not? The Honourable Minister.
Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I, I thank the member, member for uh, the uh, the question and uh, and the context for our colleagues. So I won't uh, delve into there. Uh, suffice to say, um, I think there's two points to be made in in, in response to the the inquiry. Uh, the first is if the change to the, around discoverability in the police complaints process as the member has um, advocated for was to be made, then the provisions would no longer be synchronized between the different policing agencies, the RCMP being a federal force where the complaints process and so forth is, is, is managed there. So, uh, so if we were to make that change, it would apply only to the uh, municipal uh, policing forces, and it would not apply to the RCMP. So we would no longer be in synchronization. So I just wanted to, 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 to be cognizant of that uh, point. The other thing that uh, I think that the member may not have um, noted about the language that did get updated and the way that we're actually structured, uh, although she's correct, Madam Chair, in her description of uh, time periods of when the incident occurs versus uh, when uh, you're aware of the incident. Uh, I want to present another scenario uh, where in either of those cases, whether the incident occurred when a, a, a victim or, or an applicant may have become aware of a, a wrong, in some instances, the individual may have context where even with awareness, they might be traumatized or have other factors that may still prevent them from uh, launching a complaint within that time period. What we actually have in our updated, uh, which went into effect in January provisions, actually gives the police complaints commissioner the discretion to waive and take into account the individual circumstances and context and define uh, or, or, or take on. So uh, in other words, I guess my point is uh, the language and, uh, and so forth in there around the timing is not hard and fast and restrictive in the way it once was. So it does provide that flexibility and provisions to take into context, which would go even further than what was proposed by the member around that time period. I think we just believe that the flexibility addresses that uh, concern when it would be uh, applicable to the commission. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you. Um, I, I thank the Minister for that thoughtful answer. Um, and I think the problem with discretion is that it's discretionary. So <laughs> I think that's it's a good provision. I'm glad it's there. Um, but it's highly subjective. And so I would just urge the minister to the extent uh, that, that it's possible to work with his federal counterparts to make those changes concurrently, um, you know, so that it is harmonized um, and that it, that it is fairer um, because trauma is one thing and it's important. Um, it's not, it doesn't always overlap with this discoverability issue. So We'll continue to advocate for that, but I, I do appreciate the context and the information. Um, I, I've asked the minister about um, a public review of policing services. So um, I think in, you know, in addition to the terrible anniversary that we will be um, marking this weekend, uh, there's been other issues around the RCMP uh, in the last year. I think we talked about it a little bit in the chamber. Um, there were raids conducted in Dartmouth and Halifax that weren't coordinated with local policing. Um, and there's a kind of seems to be a little bit of an upswell of a uh, question around our policing contracts and a policing review. Um, I'm wondering uh, again, whether the minister will commit to a review of policing services, just so that we can kind of have a sense of, you know, where we are in terms of provincial policing and where we wanna go. The honorable Thanks. minister. The honorable minister. Sorry, Madam Chair, I'll try to, sorry. Um, we get so engaged, we forget you're there. Um, thank you uh, for the question. 
I think, uh, as, as was noted uh, prior to uh, assuming uh, my role and, and responsibility as, as the Minister of Justice, um, uh, my predecessor uh, did note, uh, and, and I think it's consistent with uh, the work of uh, any minister in any department uh, uh, doing some work internally to evaluate uh, within our policing services. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, policing services, public safety, policing services, those uh, an area of responsibility, uh, you know, one of many areas. And within that uh, context, uh, establishing a uh, you know an internal evaluation and, and seeing what do things look like. That information internally helps inform us as to what we do more broadly and and so forth. And it's just part of uh, I think regular operational uh, processes as we would look at uh, other parts of uh, and areas of services that we provide uh, to say okay. What are we trying to accomplish here? Uh, you know, where we fit into our objectives. You know, my mandate makes it very clear. Uh, justice plans around uh, Indigenous and African Nova Scotian justice plans uh, that set the stage forward. And so I have to do this work with the department uh, to evaluate um, and analyze what's currently in place and 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 what's the the strategic direction or priorities of where we're going to go into the future. And that uh, internal analysis, that step that was initiated by my predecessor uh, is underway now. Um, where that will go uh, to the to the members uh, question in terms of a public review or, or what have you uh, should be very clear. We do have, as the member mentioned, a contract you know, uh, provincially with the RCMP, um, there are uh, contractual provisions in there when one talks about a contractual review or a review uh, under the contractual terms. Um, so there are very specific provisions and, and context that that kind of review uh, stipulates. At, at this point, as I said, we're in a preliminary stage of uh, just departmental continuous improvement, uh, analyzing policing, just as we do in, in, in uh, any other part of the work that we do as a department. Uh, to evaluate. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you. Um, with all due respect, uh, I do think that the issues that have been raised around the RCMP in the last year in this province are public issues and they concern public safety. And I think therefore that any review needs to be public. I understand that we have contracts, but I also understand that your predecessor was a lifetime RCMP member. And there have been questions raised about you know, the ability to undertake that kind of review as minister when understandably, you know, you have been a part of the force um, for the majority of your career. So uh, I just want to kind of put a fine point on this request for a public review. Of course, um, I would certainly hope that the department would be internally reviewing policing services all the time. That makes sense. That's important. Um, but, you know, the public has a lot of questions. And, uh, you know, we are not demanding a specific action of any kind, but we are asking um, for a public review, both in terms of resource allocation and taxpayer dollars, uh, public safety, you know, all of the um, goals that we have around um, public safety and policing, you know, we want to understand how those are being achieved for Nova Scotians, given, given our current system and given the public challenges that have been identified. Um, and so we would continue to ask for a uh, fully public review. Um, Moving on, uh, our caucus filed an FOI for documents and correspondence related to tickets and fines under the Health Protection and Emergency Management Act. So those are sort of the COVID tickets that have been given out. Um, and the information we received um, included uh, an email from April of 2020. So that would have been probably from your predecessor stating that the minister was concerned about police targeting marginalized communities based on anecdotal stories. Um, in response, which we think is great, the department began tracking the summary offense tickets um, in what they refer to as marginalized communities, you know, which I think include many of our historically uh, African Nova Scotian communities. So those included North End Dartmouth, ha North End Halifax, Preston and Cherry Brook, and then also Millbrook and Eskasoni, which, you know, as we know, are First Nations communities. 
at that time with an HRM, tickets issued in Cherry Brook and Preston and North Dartmouth and North Halifax made up 22% of the health protection uh, tickets that were issued in the province. And so in light of that, I'm wondering if the minister can explain what, if any, steps were taken to address concerns that racialized communities may have been targeted in enforcement. Uh, we appreciate keeping track of uh, those tickets by location, um, but certainly we see in larger jurisdictions like Ontario, massive concerns around this, not just around enforcement, but also around vaccination and other things. So we want to be aware of the racialized dimensions of this pandemic. And so I'm wondering what response uh, came from the department. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I'll just, uh, I want to take a, uh, just a quick moment uh, back to, to the, the inquiry piece, uh, just to put the, the final dot on that first. Um, I guess uh, to the member's point, and I think this was a response uh, earlier in the in this session uh, with uh, the, the previous member asking questions, and, and I didn't include it in my response, but uh, there is also a public inquiry uh, ongoing. Uh, and one of the terms of reference of that inquiry, which is public, which is independent, uh, and which does span uh, policing services in the province, is underway. Uh, and so there is a public review uh, underway uh, that is independent and separate uh, from us. And that is one of the terms and conditions around the public review uh, pertaining to the uh, mass uh, uh, casualty event uh, from last year. Um, so, as the member noted in the question and the context of it and in, in the response was um, about it being a public safety issue, and, and that's exactly what uh, that public inquiry is, is, is evaluating. Uh, and I would just like to make just one other point that was, was brought up and just in re response to, uh, I can appreciate uh, the member's um, reference to my predecessor who initiated uh, the internal work um, and his uh, previous career. Um, but I do on, you know, take a little bit of, of uh, exception to the suggestion on, uh, uh, you know, and I, I appreciate and understand the language was that questions uh, being raised about uh, his ability to perform his duties uh, based upon a previous career. Um, I, I, knowing uh, my colleague, um, I can assure the member and, and all members here in the public, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, he is a, a man of, of character and integrity. Uh, by all accounts, uh, people I've bumped into who have known uh, my colleague in his previous career um, speak uh, about his um, commitment uh, to uh, the, the people of Nova Scotia and Canada and indeed, uh, service that he provided on behalf of Canada internationally and the, through, uh, I believe, some UN initiatives. Um, there's absolutely nothing in my colleague's uh, track record that should uh, raise question or, or concern about his integrity uh, and capacity and willingness to fulfill his duties uh, and service uh, to uh, the people of Nova Scotia, either in his past career or in his current career. And I would also highlight and stress as it relates specifically to his tenure as the Minister of Justice and Attorney General for the province of Nova Scotia, uh, he did uh, engage with the Conflict of Interest Commissioner. I believe he's publicly reported on the fact that the Conflict of Interest Commissioner has himself uh, clearly delineated the fact that his previous career in no way uh, represents uh, an actual, or, nor should it, a perceived conflict of interest. So uh, while I appreciate the member's comment was not specific, suggesting herself, uh, Madam Chair, that there was a conflict, merely raising the point that there were questions. Uh, I just wanted to be on the record because merely stating the fact that there were questions without putting the context around the fact that those questions would be unfounded, and in fact that the member took the appropriate steps uh, and also is, a, uh, is a, a, an honourable member of the legislature. And indeed, I don't think he needed to be appointed to executive council to earn that honour. I think his distinguished career uh, in law enforcement uh, on behalf of, of, of Nova Scotians and the country, um, he earned that title long before he joined executive council. Uh, so that's uh, just final comments or thoughts on, on that point. Uh, as it relates to uh, the specific question here, uh, on uh, the COVID um, public health um, summary offense tickets. Uh, as the member noted, we did uh, review the data. The analysis did not find any indication or um, trends that would suggest that um, 
there was any targeting in marginalized uh, populations or communities. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth South. You have about six minutes, uh, seven minutes, six minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you to the minister. And uh, I, I, I was the I've been a justice critic for four years, and so I, I know the former minister pretty well in that role and um, was not impugning uh, his ability to do his job. It was only in reference to specifically, you know, the notion of that inquiry that questions had been raised. But I, I appreciate your comments. Um, and to that, um, in fact, uh, the former minister uh, mentioned before uh, he departed his role that this was an appropriate time, and we appreciated this comment, that, that this was an appropriate time to revisit and determine the role police play in responding to mental health calls. This has also been an issue this year. Um, we've heard two Nova Scotia police chiefs say that they also have concerns um, about whether or not their officers are properly equipped um, to deal with mental health crisis. Um, and so I'm wondering, and, and I know the minister probably has a view on this from his former department as well, what options are being considered by the department as alternatives? And is there money in this budget allocated to, to solve this issue? I recognize the honorable minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I, I thank the, the member for this very important uh, question. And in fact, I think this is roughly where we left off with the previous uh, member uh, questions. Uh, that question was, Previously, was specifically about uh, officers responding to mental health in hospital settings, uh, where I think your uh, the member's question now is in a community setting. But uh, in in my earlier response, what I, I highlight is uh, a recognition of both. And as the member uh, duly noted, my my previous role I think suits very well to this opportunity. But it is very early stages, and um, I appreciate the specific question about money in the budget to solve. This issue, I think there are many complexities around this issue. Um, you know, we look at it from the lens of the police agencies and and uh, engaging. But I think the the reason the system has evolved for police services to respond is because of the question of public safety and the role and responsibility of public safety when an individual uh, represents potentially a risk to harm for them to themselves or somebody else, um, that that's the public safety aspect rather than really the mental health piece. And I know that's where the question and the conversations go down. The police agency saying, we're not mental health experts. We shouldn't be the ones responding to a mental health crisis situation, but they're not responding as the mental health interventionist. They're responding as the public safety uh, component. So if I just for a moment flip that scenario on its head and say, okay, police are theoretically or hypothetically, the police are not the appropriate entities. It's a public health, a mental health uh, situation. So we send public health, uh, mental health uh, experts into the situation, but the situation at the time is a safety one. The individual represents harm. Those mental health professionals, while they have the mental health training and expertise for interventions, they don't have the public safety components to keep themselves and others necessarily safe. And that's why this is such a complex situation to um, find out how we can best respond. Uh, so uh, what I can say is I, I think I have a, a fair understanding conceptually of the challenge and of the perspectives of uh, the employees, both on the mental health services side, on the police services side of advocates and those, um, I mean, it's, it's a challenge sometimes for those individuals suffering from, from mental health crises, particularly of such an acute nature, but those who are advocating on their behalf um, perspective in these situations. And uh, I don't have the solutions. I don't know uh, that it's necessarily always dollars uh, to the member's question, if we need budget to solve the problem, but we do need work and we need attention, uh, and we are in the early stages of it, uh, of, of of looking at it. And uh, again, I'm, I'm I believe from my past career uh, role, uh, well positioned to to participate in the justice system to try to find a path forward. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you for the answer. I know my time is running short. You know, the budget question was more to point to a specific initiative. So I'm hopeful that we'll see some of those come forward soon. Um, 
quickly, if I can, in the time left, I want to ask, um, last year, last September, um, the former premier, um, the member for Annapolis, as he is now known, um, uh, issued a public apology for systemic racism. And at that time, he announced a design team that would reimagine the justice system in Nova Scotia. Um, we're six months into the mandate of that team, and I was wondering if the minister can provide an update on that work. I recognize the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the member for this important question. Uh, as the member knows, a lot has changed uh, in, in the province and, and uh, the government uh, since last September. Um, what I can assure the member and all, all of our colleagues, Madam Chair, is that um, tackling systemic racism, uh, I'll refer to my opening remarks uh, as to how important this is that I wanted to highlight it myself. Uh, it exists, uh, highlight uh, right up to our current premier, the, um, which I think is a continuation of our, our, our previous premier, uh, and this government's commitment to tackle these issues. Um, mandate letters, many of them, including my own as the Minister of Justice, um, to advance um, African Nova Scotian and Indigenous justice plans. Uh, that are really designed to target the reform uh, that's uh, needed in our uh, justice system to uh, tackle those systemic barriers. Um, as I think, uh, you know, I guess I summarize it as, as this, uh, our justice system has far too uh, little representation um, of many uh, communities in the legal profession and far overrepresented uh, in... Order uh, time laps for the NDP party. We will turn it over to the Progressive Conservative Party. And I recognize the Honourable Member for Inverness. You have about just under 12 minutes before our COVID break. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Minister, for having the opportunity here this afternoon. Um, my questions are related to your role as Minister responsible for the Elections Act uh, for the coming year. And um, the question I have is around proclamation of the bill that was passed a year ago uh, around uh, changes made to the Elections Act, which was Bill 225. Uh, is it, is that, does that remain unproclaimed? Is there a plan to proclaim that legislation? I recognize the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank uh, the member uh, for the question. Uh, the uh, changes have not been proclaimed. Uh, I believe uh, the bill uh, notes that it uh, goes into effect on proclamation of uh, executive council uh, or governor and council, I believe uh, is the proper terminology there. Uh, and uh, that's uh, work to uh, move forward uh, is uh, underway. Uh, so I expect to have some uh, updates uh, not too distant future when we uh, wrap here in the legislature. I recognize the member for Inverness. Thank you, Minister. And, and I know, you know, typically when a bill passes, in most cases, they're proclaimed uh, right away. Um, why is it, has it not been proclaimed? It, it's, I guess the problem it presents for elections in Nova Scotia is that um, they, they're potentially looking at down the road at having to conduct an election under two different sets of rules, depending on whether or not the legislation is proclaimed. So why the delay and, and why the, uh, the con I, I, I don't know if it's confusion, there's no confusion, but why the delay and, and why put Nova Scotia, elections Nova Scotia in position where they have to prepare to run an election under two sets of conditions? I recognize the honorable minister. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I guess uh, just contextually, uh, as I noted, the, uh, the proclamation is, is by Governor and Council, so uh, I can't uh, necessarily speak to uh, the specific context of uh, decisions of uh, Executive uh, Council in, in that regard. 
uh, to this or any other specific uh, item that obviously may uh, broach uh, you know the executive privilege and uh, my duty to uh, maintain uh, that confidence of, of that uh, body. Uh, suffice to say, uh, one can, and, and in addition to that, uh, I also was not a member of Executive Council uh, for a significant period of time uh, between the uh, legislation uh, being uh, uh, passed in the legislature uh, and uh, certainly the fall into uh, the winter uh, when perhaps it, it might have been anticipated to be proclaimed. So I, I, as, a, as a citizen and a member of the legislature, I, I would have had no line of sight on any uh, conversations or decisions that, that may have taken place at that time anyway. Uh, suffice to say, uh, you know, uh, prior to, um, you know, that, that point in, in uh, October when I stepped down as Minister of Health and Wellness, um, I guess one of the things that happened was uh, COVID, uh, where we, you know, really all hands on deck uh, throughout government uh, responding to a COVID pandemic. That was our first and, and foremost priority. Uh, across all uh, areas of government. Uh, so that would take care of the time predominantly during the spring and, and, and the summers we prepared for the second wave. And as I said, uh, I stepped down, was not in executive council uh, during the fall uh, and early winter period. Uh, I am here now, uh, I am the minister responsible uh, and uh, I uh, am taking uh, it very seriously to uh, ensure that the appropriate uh, provisions to bring it uh, forward to my colleagues uh, and uh, have executive council make uh, some decisions uh, at that point. I recognize the honorable member for Inverness. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Minister. I, I do know you, you've had a busy year in the leadership race there, and, and uh, I can certainly see uh, how that would be the case. Um, but it, this is certainly the biggest, I mean, in, in terms of being responsible for that act, th this would be probably the top item for uh, uh for the minister responsible for this act coming into this house sitting, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that it's it's been on your radar. And and uh, I guess my concern is that is it really fair for the government to be holding back on legislation that it passed itself, um, which gives the government an advantage? Only the government knows right now which set of rules the election is going to be conducted under, and the government could theoretically choose the set of rules that serves itself in this situation instead of uh, being open and transparent and uh, and proceeding with the legislation that was passed a year ago. Um, so from a fairness perspective, do you feel it's fair for the government to be holding back on this and essentially uh, having the opportunity to know what set of rules the election will be conducted under? I recognize the Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I guess uh, perhaps I'd, I would ask uh, if the member has any specific uh, provisions within the um, variance between uh, the current uh, legislation and what was uh, passed uh, last year uh, that may be considered to potentially provide an advantage or disadvantage uh, to any of the uh, participants uh, in uh, the electoral process. Um, uh, without looking at it right now in front of me, the member is correct that I've uh, certainly been uh, an active uh, file on, on my desk uh, to delve in. Uh, and part of that in, included, uh, given the time when I came in to have the conversation, uh, correspondence and have staff engage with Elections Nova Scotia, uh, to determine uh, where we're at now. We know with certainty that there must be an election within roughly one year from now. Um, so uh, given the scenario that I uh, enter into as, as the minister uh, responsible, uh, the first step uh, obviously for me is to have the conversation with the Department and Elections Nova Scotia to see if uh, proclamation is even viable at this point in time to ensure uh, so uh, those conversations and engagements uh, taking place. Um, but uh, as far as uh, fairness, uh, or if there's any, uh, as I think, uh, Madam Chair, the members uh, alluding or suggesting, um, stacking the deck, so to speak, uh, I'm not aware of any provisions in there that might provide any advantage or disadvantage. This is predominantly about modernizing and, and providing some administrative uh, changes uh, to support the uh, elections in Nova Scotia themselves. Um, so if the member has specific uh, aspects in there that uh, 
he thinks may be advantageous to proclaim or not proclaim. I certainly aren't aware of them, so I can definitely assure the member that that uh, concept has never even crossed my mind. I, I never even uh, thought of it as a uh, possible thing. So I haven't looked at the legislation with that lens. Uh, the member obviously seems to have. Uh, if he's suggesting there are pieces, I'd be happy to hear what those provisions are. I recognize the honorable member for Inverness. Uh, Madam Chair, um, we have a government passing a bill in the legislature. It's proclaimed every other bill except for this one. It's causing headaches for elections in Nova Scotia, which is the organization that is uh, that has no skin in the political game. They just want to conduct a fair election. Uh, they are concerned about this. They've approached me months ago about this, wondering why isn't this legislation proclaimed? It's certainly a fair question to ask. The minister is claiming confidential cabinet confidentiality that he can't really speak on it. He's also saying that he hasn't really uh, maybe been there when it was discussed because he has been busy the past year and was, was not in the executive council for a period of time. But coming to the House uh, this spring with an election in the offing very soon, within the next year, Minister, I find it incredibly strange that the government remains undecided on whether or not it's going to proclaim legislation it passed. Can you explain why that is? I recognize the Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, as I uh, previously uh, noted, uh, I can't speak uh, for a period of time when I was not uh, there. Uh, to uh, contemplate uh, as it relates to uh, the proclamation of this legislation during my tenure. Uh, as I've uh, indicated, uh, one of the first steps uh, through uh, my transition uh, into the role, uh, this is a, a topic that I delved into uh, very early on, uh, pulled the information uh, necessary together. One of those uh, components was to have staff engage in the conversation with Elections Nova Scotia to determine uh, whether or not I need to know uh, at this point in time. Again, I can't speak to uh, previous points in time. At this point in time, if it's viable to uh, move forward and proclaim, or if uh, there would be barriers if uh, it was to be proclaimed. Uh, and that guidance, uh, to me, is, is coming from Elections Nova Scotia. Um, so uh, again, if uh, I was to be advised uh, by Elections Nova Scotia, that proclamation uh, now or before the next election was to be uh, burdensome and a barrier uh, to their ability to uh, safely and successfully uh, and in an unbiased way to uh, administer the election. Uh, that would certainly be information I would have to bring forward to executive council, governor and council uh, when making the decision. Um, so again, uh, I've been here uh, a few uh, weeks. Uh, that was uh, those uh, conversations and engagement uh, taking place. Uh, and again, I will be guided in the information I bring forward uh, by that independent body, uh, Elections Nova Scotia, as to uh, pro proclamation uh, of uh, this particular uh, bill. I recognize the honorable member for Inverness. Madam Chair, one, one of the barriers for elections in Nova Scotia is the fact that the legislation was passed but has not yet been proclaimed. Is the minister concerned that elections in Nova Scotia is concerned that this legislation is yet to be proclaimed? I recognize the honorable minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ch Madam Chair. Uh, one thing, uh, again, in terms of the time, and I know the members uh, alluding and suggesting in terms of how much time has elapsed, uh, which is about a year from when it was passed uh, to uh, this point in, uh, in time. Uh, the uh, thing that the members here, Madam Chair, yourself and others uh, should be aware of, is that in fact, uh, even if uh, this legislation had been uh, proclaimed uh, upon royal assent, uh, that is uh, immediately okay. upon passing. Order, that, it's uh, time. Order, it's time for our COVID break and Hold those thoughts, Minister, and uh, the Honourable Member for Inverness, and we'll return at 4.05. And I think Mr. Bain is back. He may, uh, are you going to take over? Okay, thank you. See you at 4.05.
the subcommittee of the whole on supply resumes. Uh, we left off uh, with the member from Inverness. Uh, he had to step out, but I believe the uh, the minister has a response. And after the response, I'll recognize the member from Truro Millbrook, Truro Bible Hill Millbrook Salmon River. The minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess uh, I believe I've, I've, I think I've already answered uh, the question. I'll try, try again. Uh, again, uh, as I indicated, uh, when I came in uh, to office just uh, a, a few uh, weeks ago, uh, uh, this was one of the important files uh, that uh, was uh, brought to my attention uh, that uh, I dug into, uh, that I reviewed. Uh, Asked uh, for a contact uh, with Elections oh, Nova Scotia oh, to, about that. I had to, to jump see if on and chair the meeting and unexpected. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so, with the uh, engagement that uh, took place, uh, again asking staff to, to reach out, uh, because one of the most important mm -hmm. things, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, to me uh, in my role and responsibility uh, before bringing uh, information forward. Uh, to uh, executive council, governor and council, uh, is to ensure that uh, what I'm bringing forward is achievable. And uh, so I had to uh, inquire and make sure uh, if uh, this um, proclamation, given the fact at that point when I came into office, uh, it, um, you know, we are roughly within a year of uh, an election taking place, if that uh, presented problems or issues. Um, that uh, conversation with staff and election of Scotia taking place. Uh, and then, of course, there's the administrative process to move forward uh, with any item that gets brought forward to uh, Executive Council uh, for consideration. Uh, and uh, again, as the legislation stipulates, Governor and Council will make a decision uh, with the information. Uh, but again, at the heart of uh, this legislation, as was the case for, uh, as I'm sure the members would uh, remember, the legislation itself, when it was brought forward to the legislature, was really informed by the commission and the review uh, and so forth. This is not legislation that is really uh, government legislation. Uh, this is uh, nonpartisan, uh, passed unanimously uh, and is going through, as I said, uh, in, in my context, uh, review, uh, but uh, guided by um, Election Nova Scotia and ultimately uh, my colleagues at uh, Governor Council to uh, make that final decision on time. I recognize the member for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River, with 45 minutes left for the uh, PC caucus. Member. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Minister, uh, through the chair. I'd like to ask just a couple questions around uh, uh, the provincial courthouse, courthouses in Truro, uh, both aging, uh, aging locations. Um, and uh, I had previous communication with the previous minister, uh, and, and he uh, put in a letter that uh, there was a strategic development plan for the courthouses across the province. And I guess my first question to that is, is Truro in that, uh, in that strategic plan and as part of the budget? Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome uh, to the member. Uh, I think this is our, our first time uh, having an opportunity uh, to engage through the chair. Um, so welcome uh, to, uh, to, to estimates. Um, as it relates to the review that I believe uh, my predecessor was referring to, uh, that was a, an infrastructure review process uh, being uh, started and initiated. Uh, encompassing the entire court system. So really all infrastructure uh, being uh, assessed and contemplated through that. Uh, as the me member uh, knows, and I know uh, this is likely a frustrating uh, response, um, but with COVID, uh, a lot of initiatives um, would take a bit of a pause uh, to redirect the energy and focus uh, on uh, the needs to ensure that, uh, again, in, in this uh, third branch, the court system, are uh, able to conduct themselves, carry on their business, maintain the justice uh, role, that, that they, the important role of third branch of government, uh, independent of, of our, our legislative and executive branches uh, to do their work. 
Um, so uh, where the priorities have shifted, obviously, is maintaining and operationalizing uh, infrastructure and other tools to enable uh, those in the judicial branch through the courts uh, to conduct their business on behalf of the people of Nova Scotia safely in light of COVID. So uh, there hasn't been much uh, progress uh, with that uh, initiative uh, over the past year as many of the individuals doing this work both within the department uh, and, and other departments like infrastructure that would be a part and parcel of doing this work, but also those uh, within uh, the courts and the judiciary uh, obviously have been very, very busy uh, ensuring that they have uh, appropriate resources, uh, space, both virtual and physical, uh, to uh, continue their operations safely in a COVID uh, pandemic. Um, but uh, the work broadly is still uh, on the books. To your specific question of money, uh, I don't believe there's uh, funding specifically for the Truro Courthouse in this uh, budget, uh, which would uh, show up, I believe, probably as a part of the capital plan, if, uh, if there had been. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister, uh, for the, the kind welcome. I appreciate that. Uh, again, just on the courthouse issue, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the media, media article there, I guess it would be a couple months ago now, um, around uh, holding cells. And obviously, COVID uh, has played a, played a challenging uh, has challenges, I guess, uh, with respect to our court system. This one in particular is the one on Prince Street, the provincial courthouse. Um, and uh, there's pictures, pictures in the media of a bus holding, uh, holding uh, I don't know, uh, clients, let's say, on, on a bus uh, with the sheriff department, uh, very unsafe. Um, and it was due to overloaded or overcrowded uh, cells at the uh, local uh, municipal police station, uh, as well as, uh, there was uh, no holding capacity at the uh, the local courthouse, so hence hence why the urgency around uh, around uh, I guess around the uh, courthouse and the infrastructure on Prince Street. It used to be Snook Save Easy, it used to be a grocery store, and uh, you know uh, I just see we're centrally located again. Uh, we're in the hub, right in the middle. We're probably the second, maybe even the you know the yeah, second is what uh, the judge had told me in uh, case volume, uh, as well as we have uh, a Supreme Court in a 130-year-old municipal building uh, uptown. So again, it comes back to safety, public safety in general, uh, and uh, you know modernization. And you know they're really concerned uh, for for safety. There's one trial there. Um, it was a federal trial, or it was a sorry. A, a murder trial uh, at the uh, in the Supreme Court that the, the sheriff sheriff department were uh, didn't feel safe uh, taking the prisoner up those flights of stairs to get him into the courtroom. So they had to call the Toronto police to come in and uh, uh, look after it, um, and that's a little bit alarming as well. So again, it comes back to aging buildings, safety, uh, you know, uh, overloads in cells. Uh, half in the whole prisoner or not prisoners clients I'm going to call them uh, on a bus um, just very unsafe and uh, not uh, not modern and uh, I just uh, really would like uh, the minister just to reply to those uh, two items I appreciate it thank you the honorable minister
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, thank uh, the member for, I think, several points that, that came up there. So I'll do my best to make sure I, 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 I speak to them all. If I miss some, please, uh, my apologies in advance. Uh, there was a lot there. Uh, I guess first, uh, as it relates to the scenario with the bus that was referenced, uh, my understanding from uh, staff in that uh, context was that there were no uh, inmates uh, there, that uh, the scenario or the circumstance uh, where that uh, transpired uh, was a matter of, um, as I've said earlier, uh, as a result of COVID, not just in our courts, but in uh, all aspects of our society, um, public health limits on the number of people allowed inside in particular and in, in, in uh, space. Um, so as you can imagine in a courthouse under normal non-pandemic uh, circumstances, um, people who show up for appearances, and these are not necessarily criminal appearances, but administrative uh, appearances could be a traffic violation or, or what have you uh, in court for appearances. Um, you would be in the court building waiting uh, to be called forward and, and perhaps in the in the in the court itself or in the hallway or, or another space uh, with covid these individuals who show up on what what they refer to as appearance day uh, kind of an administrative working the way through the the system there uh, you would have a lot of people and, and scheduled to come in and, and people show up before necessarily the scheduled time so that particular bus was being used uh, as I understand it, for uh, people who were able to wait. So think of it more as a waiting room, uh, but not about uh, fenders. So this is not, that space was not being used like a holding cell, but rather more uh, akin, I believe, to a waiting room. Uh, so just in terms of the safety security concerns that the member uh, raised there on that uh, particular instance. And so what though that image and that scenario though pointed out is the challenge with it, particularly early on uh, in uh, the pandemic with, uh, and, and as, as the courts were opening up more in light of the pandemic, uh, how important scheduling was uh, and is to maintain uh, the safe from a public health perspective, operation of the courthouse, scheduling to ensure that people don't get backed up, that people can transition and, and appropriate um, sanitization or sterilization uh, steps that get taken to, to clean the environment and all of the work that's necessary um, to keep people safe. Uh, staff, um, those uh, showing for appearances, uh, uh, those who um, I believe you refer to as, as clients, um, but uh, if they've been charged as offenders uh, would uh, be, um, we wanna keep them all safe. We want everybody to be safe and that's that process is and I think another important thing to keep in mind as it relates to this whole environment and space is, you know, as I mentioned briefly earlier, is remember there are three branches to government. Uh, I'm here today uh, representing in my role in the as a member of the executive branch, uh, really the operational side of of, of government. Uh, colleagues here on the committee are, are here operating in their legislative capacity which is to oversee and, and, and hold uh, us and the executive branch uh, accountable. But we sometimes forget that the judicial branch is the third branch of government. And so while there's overlap in so much as, uh, you know, funding transfers through, uh, gets approved, you know, uh, brought forward in the executive branch, gets approved by the legislative branch, uh, funding for the judiciary and their operations flows through. Uh, but operationally, uh, it's the judges are responsible for their courthouse space, and the chief judge uh, oversees the overarching um, priorities and, and spaces uh, within the entire uh, judiciary uh, position. Our department, and from an executive branch, we do provide administrative supports and flow through and obviously ad advocate for the, the funding uh, that covers the operational costs necessary by the judicial branch. But again, those operational uh, responsibilities, scheduling and so forth, and and uh, things do uh, get um, administered by the uh, judges and justices within the court system, independent of both the judicial, uh, sorry, the, the executive and, and legislative branches. But we obviously have to uh, work with them uh, when they uh, identify their priorities. And you, the member, Mr. Chair, made reference to um, aging and the need for modernization. And in fact, that is one of the things, not just in the justice system, but I think throughout society, there's been a, a 
a huge jump forward in efforts to modernize many aspects of society and many services. And the judiciary, the judicial system is not exempt. And I made reference to it earlier. I won't waste to take more of the member's time. Um, but uh, virtual courthouse uh, proceedings and a number of initiatives that I referenced in my opening remarks have already taken place to support uh, uh, access to justice in Truro and across the province. The member for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Minister, for the answer. Um, I am now going to pass it over to my colleague from Cumberland North. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hello, Minister. I guess it's okay to talk directly. Um, I'm just going to ask one question, and then I'm going to ask if it would be possible to follow up um, offline um, with whoever would be most appropriate in your department. And my question um, is around law enforcement and who would be responsible to ensure um, adequate staffing, specifically within RCMP. And I'm just gonna share, the reason I'm asking that question is but there's been some concerns here in Cumberland with um, staffing and uh, a percentage, a large percentage of people being off sick or on, off leave and leaving the force understaffed. And then we're seeing that in particular, uh, I had a, um, a victim who had reported a sexual assault and there had been no follow-up in nine weeks. And it still was something like 16 weeks before charges were laid. So um, there is a concern about staffing and ratio, and I do have other questions in relation to sexual assault, Crown prosecutors, and sexual assault cases, but I can ask those um, offline with whoever be most appropriate in your department. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and I thank the member uh, for the question. And um, uh, I appreciate the frustration. Uh, you're, you're, I'm assuming your constituent um, that uh, you, you you gave a brief example of a, a situation um, would would be feeling and and uh, those circumstances because. Um, as, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, a lot of effort is, is being conducted to uh, improve our, our response to sexualized uh, violence uh, throughout uh, the system. Uh, so that is a priority and, and we've made a, a lot of efforts, my predecessor and, and throughout other aspects of government. So, so uh, I know those, those circumstances you've described is not reflective of the objective and the, the outcomes that uh, we're pursuing as a, as a government. And I think all members of the legislature share those objectives. We had lots of conversations about it. To your specific question of uh, staffing within RCMP, uh, we do have a, a contract uh, with RCMP to provide provincial police services. Um, some municipalities uh, also have a contract with RCMP to provide municipal policing services. But within that agreement, within the, the contract and the way they're structured, uh, the RCMP are a national force. Uh, they provide their uh, staffing, as you say, ratios and, and so forth uh, for the services uh, that they uh, deliver um, you know, in, a, in a given uh, time. Uh, and I'm just put one other piece, although I, I can't speak to the, the specific uh, circumstance, so very much in a generality, uh, you made the member made reference to um, length of time to filing charges. I would just um, put a little footnote, perhaps, that uh, I don't think we can always make judgment calls about how long it would take to lay charges or whether charges do get laid in a particular situation. Um, because those decisions uh, get made uh, as uh, they pursue investigation on the policing uh, and then, um, you know, come up with and, and determine, you know, the information, the evidence against the, the, the laws and, and, and so forth um, before making those decisions. And, and sometimes the evidence is, is clearer and more available and, and, and charges can be, be laid uh, more quickly. And, and sometimes, uh, and again, I can't, I'm not speaking on the specific, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily be able to draw conclusions based upon the duration to charges uh, from a concern being raised. 
Okay. The honorable Thank member. Thank you, Minister. And, and uh, in this particular case, it was, uh, there was a member that had been reported to was uh, no longer there and no one else had picked up the case. So there, there was a, a definite gap, but um, I'm going to pass it on to my uh, colleague from Pictou West. Thank you, Minister. I recognize the honorable member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I know our time is limited, and I know I still have a colleague after me that wants to ask um, some questions, so um, I, thank goodness um, most of uh, my questions have been asked, whether or not um, by my uh, colleagues or of uh, the opposition party, so um, I'm going to just be quick and, and hope that we can uh, get quick answers. So First question, uh, the one that we were cut off the other day in question period, the detox center in Picto. Quickly, uh, an update of what's happening. The Minister Thanks, of Justice. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, there's no uh, firm decisions uh, around uh, that property. Uh, as the member noted then and, and is well aware, it was uh, being used as a health facility no longer. Um, there is a, a partner organization in the community that uh, uh, may have some some use that uh, they provide some services to justice, so we're evaluating, and there's some some work ongoing, but uh, too early to to say uh, whether uh, that will materialize or not. But we're certainly engaged in in a potential use uh, of the facility uh, with a, a partner community organization providing services. The honourable member. Thank you. Uh, is that the John Howard Society minister? The honourable minister. Uh, sorry, uh, just not to take more time, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to disclose the uh, member, so not to take more time. I'll, I'll follow okay. up and, and let you know. If I determine that I'm able to disclose uh, the, the, the organization, uh, I will follow up with you offline, uh, fo follow up with the member offline, Mr. Chair. Member? Thank you. Okay, just heading right into... Um, Okay, I'm a firm believer, it's just my opinion that I believe all high schools that have X amount, I don't know if it would be 50 or 100, but definitely when you have a school of 1,200 kids from grades 9 to 12, they should have a resource officer. This was an initiative that I think was brought in by the NDP. Uh, so we had an RCMP officer at Northumberland Regional High School. Now, I know he did share a bit of his time with a few other schools, but mostly at this school, because you can imagine 1,200 students, it's, that's where the focus was. Um, increase in drugs, um, sexual assault, it's just, it's rampant. And this officer has been off for a year with, rightly so, I'm not questioning why the officer is off. I want to know why someone wasn't replaced, and I want to know when they are going to get replaced. So we've had a whole school year without an officer there. Uh, just, Mr. Chair, just very quickly uh, for the specific location, I uh, just to help inform: is that a uh, an RCMP or a municipal uh, officer that uh, the member is referring to at that site? RCMP. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you uh, to the member. Uh, look, uh, I think uh, on this particular one, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I might need want to connect with the member offline. Um, you know, under under normal circumstances, we'd certainly expect that uh, you know a, a vacant uh, resource uh, so, you know would be uh, filled. Uh, so I'm I'm just not familiar with the specific uh, site and, and location. So if we touch base offline or you reach out to my, my executive assistant, I'm sure we can uh, try to navigate that one and see what's going on specifically. Uh, again, as I mentioned to the previous uh, question, 
um, staffing are uh, the responsibility of, of uh, the RCMP uh, process. Um, but uh, again, if we have a, a, an allocated resource, uh, they should be uh, filling those, those positions. So something we can look into. The member for Pick the West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, with those two questions, I'm definitely going to hold the minister to get back in touch with me. They're very important um, to my constituents, two, two big issues that are really happening here right now. People worried about the detox center, what's happening with it. Um, and I, I'm, I've never in my eight years had so many calls from the high school with concerns with finding needles and drugs, and it's just rampant. Um, so having the presence of an officer there doesn't doesn't solve everything, but it certainly helps having a presence. Um, okay, most of my questions about human trafficking ha trafficking have been answered. Um, I know that all members of the house know that this is a very passionate area for me. Um, regardless of not being the critic for um, for justice, I still remain very involved and. Uh, I, I just want to first, before I end with this last question, I do want to give a big shout out to the past minister from uh, Bridgewater to his staff. They were always very good to me. And um, I think they did a lot of work around this subject matter. And I, and I am just so pleased, but we, and I know they know, and I know the new minister knows there's still a lot of work to be done. Where I struggle is that, Three of the bills that I introduced that most people are aware, two I do believe were adopted into policy and regulations, and that's wonderful. I really don't care who gets the credit. Um, really, the staff gets the credit and, and the past minister, which is great. But I'm really disappointed that my third bill, to make it mandatory um, education in the curriculum, um, is not being addressed. And I will continue pushing that, but I want to know right now what the minister's department feels the reason is for still remaining to be the highest province with um, the highest reported uh, human trafficking uh, incidents. Uh, and if his department believes that actually implementing something in the educational system to make it mandatory to learn about this would help. Thank you. The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, very quickly, I'm going to jump back to the first of the two that I promised to follow up to the member with. Uh, I, staff, are, it is okay to disclose. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, it is the John Howard Society that we're in discussions with for some services that they would be providing. Uh, so again, that work is ongoing, some assessments and things. So preliminary to make any kind of public announcements about what may occur, but uh, I, I assure the member uh, if uh, things proceed and, and conclude, we'll do public uh, notification announcement of, of the services and, and what have you. Um, the specific question on the um, education, uh, you know, as far as being incorporated into curriculum, uh, that obviously is, is something uh, with the, the education department. That's not something that I would have the capacity to do mandating through. Um, but uh, it did come up actually a little bit earlier as well. So I, I did touch on that. And and that I think, uh, again, uh, where and how education can play a role, not just around human trafficking, but other aspects of sexualized violence and, and systemic uh, issues uh, around that. Um, and, and whether it's through formalized education system uh, broadly in society, the need to get information uh, age appropriately uh, into the hands of our, our youth uh, is, is really important uh, to both keep them safe, but also to keep them uh, from 
becoming engaged in uh, inappropriate behaviors as well. So uh, recognize that, and uh, you know, uh, I think uh, all members of the legislature support these outcomes. To the specific question about um, why uh, Nova Scotia ranks uh, high, I think this is uh, uh, information uh, that we're still trying to tease apart and, and come to a full understanding of that. Um, preliminary, uh, you know, there's some um, things uh, uh, about, uh, you know, geographic location being port uh, sited, uh, close proximity and the ease of, of, of trans, you know, transferring into uh, the proximity of other jurisdictions, which once you cross boundaries, it, it makes it more difficult uh, from a policing perspective. And that's one of the reasons why we, we try to work and, and focus and I think uh, work with our, uh, our partners and, and try to uh, connect, uh, you know, I hope to with my, my Atlantic uh, counterparts and and, and federally as well to uh, try to uh, recognize that uh, when you get into human trafficking, it's not any individual jurisdiction. It in fact uh, spans multiple jurisdictions and, uh, and uh, we need to work together uh, to solve the problem wherever the incident uh, originates. Um, isn't the important part i don't believe in in this it's 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 that we we we, we tackle um those issues and and part of it we need to do together to understand uh, but also to uh, resolve and uh, again this remains a, a high priority it's outlined in my mandate letter and, and will be uh, uh, as my, my predecessor uh, uh it will continue to be i think uh at, and and i appreciate the support that uh, all members of the legislature and on all political parties, I think, share this objective. And, and that makes uh, our job in the executive branch uh, that much easier when we know we have the support of the legislative branch to make these uh, tackle these complex um, and longstanding issues. The Honourable Member for Pick the West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank the Minister for those answers. And we'll certainly uh, be following up again, thanks to his department and the past minister. Um, and I know the current minister has had a lot of responsibility with big portfolios. And I know he'll do a great job with this one too. And I look forward to working with him. So for now, I'll hand it over to my colleague, I think who has about 10 minutes or nine with, um, uh, Oh my gosh, Argyle, Barrington, Argyle, Argyle, Barrington. <laughs> I recognize the honorable member for Argyle, Barrington. You actually have 15 minutes left. Oh, 15 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, the, my colleague from Picto West is correct. It is still uh, Argyle, Barrington, but hopefully next session it will be, uh, I'll be the member for Argyle. Um, I guess I, I just have a, a couple short question, uh, brief questions, and if I do have time, I'll pass it back to my colleague from Picto West uh, so she can continue her conversation uh, with the minister. But I do want to take a, uh, the moment to, to thank the minister for uh, the opportunity uh, to ask him a, que a few questions this afternoon and, and for his staff support um, during, uh, during estimates here. Um, the, the topic that I, I do want to discuss with the minister is probably one that he's familiar with due to his... Um, uh, previous ministerial duties as Minister of Health uh, and coincides uh, with, with his new portfolio and it is the uh, uh, wellness courts in, in Nova Scotia. Um, and I've heard you know, lots of success uh, from the, uh, this program here, this, this sector of, of courts in our province and there's a number of, of, of wellness courts in Nova Scotia, you know, Dartmouth, Halifax, Sydney, Amherst, Kentville, Paroxbury, Bridgewater, Wagmac took uh, Wagmac Cook First Nation, um, but there's none in southwestern Nova Scotia. It's a it's a very big uh, region. If you go from uh, Kentville to Bridgewater, that um, a big demographic of our of our provinces is being um, missed here. Uh, recognizing that um, the situations that may uh, lead Nova Scotians to end up uh, getting in trouble with the law, whether it be and complex with uh, mental illness, substance abuse and gambling, and that they'd fit into the criteria to, you know, be to go through the courts um, through a different means. Um, I just I've I'm, I'm lost for words, I guess, of why we don't have this court yet here in southwestern Nova Scotia. I know it's the two years ago, the program celebrated its uh, 10th uh, anniversary. Uh, I've, I've written to the previous minister. I, I've spoken with the minister uh, offline at the time. So I'm just wondering, what are the barriers to getting wellness court in, in the tri-county region? Uh, and what is being done to uh, ensure that it's going to be implemented in, in due time? 
The Honorable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank uh, the member uh, for uh, the question. Uh, and uh, in fact, I, I, I can uh, advise the, the member. Um, uh, in fact, uh, my our colleague uh, from Yarmouth uh, also in inquired recently uh, about uh, this very same same question. Um, and and there's a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, obviously it's a agree it's it's not there, but uh, also agree that uh, the services in the um, the outcomes uh, that we're seeing uh, in Nova Scotia, I think, being a, a leader in in the adoption and uh, and the success. Uh, I made reference to this uh, earlier, Mr. Chair, but I'll, I'll do it again. That our justice system isn't just about crime and punishment; uh, it's about really the overall objective to um, rehabilitate. And I think this is where these wellness courts really uh, tackle uh, the underlining uh, components to, to help support. So I appreciate uh, the members' um, uh, commitment or, or support in, in principle of, of these services. Uh, but as I also mentioned a little bit earlier, the complexity in the ju justice system in, 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 in space, because you know, when you're talking about courts and, and so forth, we're really having multiple, not just departments uh, engaged, but you're actually engaging with multiple branches of government. And these are independent branches of government that we engage with. Um, so we, we, we work collaboratively and we have a good working relationship, um, but it's not something the government does uh, independently uh, of our own uh, initiative. So uh, there is a, certainly a, a wellness uh, steering committee, um, a wellness court uh, steering committee, uh, really uh, led, I believe, uh, by uh, representatives in, in the judiciary and the judges uh, to help inform and, and they're working. Uh, broadly on a sustainability plan uh, for uh, government's consideration. And uh, so uh, that uh, work is ongoing. And, and this isn't specifically to uh, that uh, Southwest region, but broadly in the province. Uh, and the other thing I, I would just note again, uh, in the short term, if you're saying like right now, today, why don't you just flip the switch? Uh, the other piece is right now, today, a lot of uh, resources are, and, and I don't just mean financial, I, I mean human resources are really focused on, again, keeping people safe, uh, modernizing the courts um, for the sake of modernizing, but in response in particular to the, the health and safety needs because of the COVID pandemic. So uh, some of the effort that might have been working on uh, prior to la this time last year, uh, has been redirected uh, to get us through some of these these technical components, and uh, so uh, all of this work uh, is is well underway. And uh, the integration between, as you said, the health system, the judicial system, the executive branch, as well as the uh, judicial branch of government, all of those complexities uh, mean it does take a little bit of time to uh, make any individual court uh, come to fruition. But uh, still, a, a pride I think of our judicial and uh, justice system. The honourable member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And how much time do I have left? I, if you don't mind. You have eight minutes. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I, and I thank the minister very much for, for that response. And, and I guess it's just recognizing that these courts uh, are truly problem solving courts and, it, and the minister alluded to, it's not to necessarily punish, um, punish individuals and punish Nova Scotians and, um, because in instances we see a, a revolving door um, that um, they go through the criminal justice system without getting um, the actual care or treatment that they may need for their um, their addiction or their substance abuse or, or their or gambling um, gambling uh, problem. Um, I, I guess what what's like is there a timeline for the department like i know that the minister spoke previously with my with my colleague from from picto west and or i believe it was picto west that said you know there's of course the three branches of government and work independently um but is uh, has has the department of justice um sort of 
communicated with the judiciary and say, you know, by such date, we were looking for a, a proposal or has the judiciary said by such date, we will have a proposal. Like, uh, I guess that's where I'm looking at right now. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't have, uh, I'm not aware of a, a specific uh, date uh, for the work other than the work is ongoing. Uh, and again, uh, again, what slightly complicates it is a lot of the work by a, a lot of similar people are, are working on other aspects of, of uh, the, the uh, modernization effort. So it's not that work isn't being done uh, to help uh, ensure access to justice. Um, it's just uh, from a slightly different uh, perspective right now. Uh, but nobody's forgotten. Uh, this is still uh, an important uh, part of the justice system. The Honourable Member. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate uh, the Minister's response, and, and I honestly hope that um, there will be an expansion of this very valuable um, court um, to the Tri-County region. I, I do want to pivot with the few moments that remain um, and speak to a situation that didn't necessarily directly impact my constituency, but the neighbouring constituencies, but however, it's um, many of my constituents felt um, felt the the issue and it's regarding the the moderate livelihood um issue in, in clare um and, and regarding the safety of of all um of all those and, and you know i i i am alive to the fact that uh, dfo has a role and responsibility the coast guard has a resp responsibility uh and as well as as our police forces and and in the clare area it's it's the rcmp and and i've you know, uh, seen different photos and read different stories that there's a significant uh, amount of, of resources that were uh, deployed to that area. Um, there are concerns of, of things uh, heating up both on and off the water um, with, with, you know, warmer weather coming upcoming. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, what the minister's involvement in ensuring that uh, the safety for, for all is ensured um, as this uh, issue continues to simmer. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for the and, and to the member for the, the important question. Um, operationally, uh, if the member is referring to uh, operationally, uh, if uh, things were to percolate and, and uh, public safety was to become a, an issue or a concern, um, operationally and on the ground, that would uh, really fall to the uh, police force, uh, the RCMP, uh, and and uh, if, uh, depending on the region, um, potentially municipal uh, forces as well. But uh, fundamentally, the, the public safety component operationally for ensuring uh, that um, uh, public safety is, is, is directly to the uh, policing agencies. Um, as that rolls up in, in terms of responding to, you know, uh, issues like uh, enhanced resource requests or, or what have you, um, you know, if there, you know, that uh, aspect of the contract uh, outlines uh, where uh, approvals and things, uh, if uh, necessary, uh, to engage additional resources and things would come into the department and, and uh, the minister uh, uh, responsible for public safety myself. But as far as from an operational perspective, uh, that's not my, my role. It's, it's, it's really to support and work with our policing agencies uh, from a, a resourcing um, uh, allocation uh, if, uh, if needed. The member with three minutes left. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I wonder if the minister has any um, concerns uh, that have been expressed to him th or throughout the through the department um, regarding the, the situation, um, uh, whether it be you know for demand for resources, allocation of resources, um, or does everything seem to be okay um, when it, in this regard of the, on this file, Minister? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um... I'm just going to try to choose my, my, my language carefully a little bit. Uh, obviously, uh, I don't want to delve into an, an area to um, jeopardize any, any efforts or works of our, our policing agencies. So I'll, I'll keep it very high level. Uh, suffice to say, um, the capacity and the ability, and I think our, our, our province in the last year has shown uh, how resources, uh, one of the advantages of the RCMP uh, is that they are a national force, so that resources both provincially, they serve us at provincially, 
uh, and are able to redeploy resources within the province very quickly, uh, but also because they are part of a national force, if, if additional resources are ever required for any reason, um, there's the ability to quickly mobilize and garnish support from other jurisdictions across the country. So there's one of those, those advantages of, of, of uh, securing those uh, services from a national uh, police force. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, without getting into details, what I would say is I'm, I'm confident in the, in the work and the due diligence of our policing agency, uh, to, uh, st and, and, and other partners to stay on top of, uh, uh, all, uh, circumstances that intelligence would suggest may represent a risk to public safety and uh, that uh, I have confidence in their uh, willingness and ability to prepare uh, for any uh, instances for which they have the capacity or the intelligence uh, to prepare for. The member was one minute. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, I guess with this last minute, uh, I'll, I'll again thank the minister for his responses uh, this afternoon. And I, I too do have confidence in in, in uh, the ability of our of our uh, police forces um, and, and the the resources that they have uh, at their disposal to ensure the the safety uh, of all. Um, you know, it's um, it is uh, <laughs> frightening situations that uh, have taken place in in this part of the province, um, and it's unfortunate that they're yet to be resolved. But um, that's uh, you know beyond beyond the minister's um, jurisdiction. Um, but I do hope with time that it will come to uh, a peaceful resolution. And I hope if um, if the situation- Order, please. The time for the PC caucus has expired. Uh, we only have uh, 12 minutes left and uh, I don't know how long the minister is gonna take for his closing remarks. And maybe if he can give some indication it might help both the member and myself. Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I will uh, defer and use only the amount of time for closing remarks as the member wishes. Uh, I just need a few seconds for the resolution. If the member wants me to make other closing remarks, I, I will do so. But if she wants to use all of her time, um, I'm welcome to con uh, concede that as well. That's fine. Thank you. So as it stands now, we'll go to 504 and allow the minister to, to make his uh, remarks. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the minister. I wanted to go back to a question I asked before the break um, because I don't, I didn't hear an answer about the design team to reimagine the justice system in Nova Scotia. So the minister said things have changed since last September, and I understand that. And I'm wondering, is that team still working, or is there a different approach being considered? The minister of justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the design team, uh, to the best of my knowledge, was was not kind of officially uh, designed, and it's not part of of the like official the Department of Justice. Um, so uh, that's why uh, when I referred to uh, the work that we're doing and and our priorities and and focus on the the justice planning uh, for the. Uh, you're on mute. So, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> doing the uh, justice plan for the African Nova Scotian and the Indigenous uh, justice plan is, as outlined in my mandate letter. Um, we uh, have a, a new office uh, within government now as well, uh, focused on, on tackling uh, racism and systemic issues in our, in our society. Um, so uh, I, I think just the uh, Underlining all of it, uh, whatever one calls uh, a team or an initiative, uh, I think the fact and, and fundamentally uh, remains uh, that broadly government direction uh, from the premier uh, right on down, uh, and I believe this is consistent in both the uh, you know, and all branches of government, a desire and a commitment to educate ourselves, educate our partners and our community uh, to learn uh, from past behaviors and so forth to inform uh, our path forward to tackle and, and take down systemic barriers and, and issues 
Um, and, and I mean, here we're talking specifically about justice, but I think broadly in government, uh, you can look at my colleagues' mandate letters, there's a lot of reference and, and focus, and, and we know this is a part of our premier and, and our government's uh, commitment, not just in justice, but, uh, but across the board. The Honourable Member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So one last kick at the can here. Um, I recognize um, the commitment. I mean, I, I think the former Premier's uh, apology was very articulate, um, relatively well received. I, I read the mandate letters. I, I know that this government has expressed a commitment. There, was, there were two people hired. They had offices. They had a mandate. They had 18 months to set this up. And my question is, is that project still happening or not? Um, and I guess I'll just add on in the interest of time, you know, that project itself, as you, as the minister must be aware, um, came under some fire um, and was somewhat controversial. Uh, and one of the reasons was that the African Nova Scotia Decade for People of African Descent Coalition, DPAD, had in fact much earlier submitted their own African Nova Scotian Justice Institute plan to the department. Um, we also introduced that in the form of a bill. So if the minister can just clarify whether that project continues or not, are those people still under contract with the department or not? I, I, I Notwithstanding the commitment, that's fine. I, I appreciate those comments. Um, and, and, and will the minister or the department or the new office who we can't question here, um, be entertaining um, DPAD's proposal. The Honourable uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I guess, uh, again, I, I, I apologize if, uh, if you know, previously I wasn't quite uh, clear enough. As I mentioned, the um, the design team wasn't allocated or assigned. So, and and when the members uh, asking about those resources, they're not part of this department. So I, I can't comment uh, on uh, where the resources are or whether those resources are uh, deployed and and what their uh, work uh, would be uh, as part of that uh, because they're not part of this department uh, and and hadn't been uh, part of this department. So. Uh, that, that's why when I say I can't speak to it, I, I can't speak to it because they were never here as, as part of this department. Um, but as it relates to uh, the DPAD um, uh, proposal uh, and engagement uh, with uh, that organization, uh, we are definitely engaged. Uh, we have received uh, the proposal. It's, it's being reviewed. Uh, engagement is, is taking place. Uh, but it, from my perspective, from the perspective of the department, Mr. Chair, uh, it's being done uh, per my mandate uh, to establish and, and develop a, a broad um, African Nova Scotian as well as and separately an, an, uh, an Indigenous uh, justice plan uh, for the province to set the stage and the path forward. So uh, yes, that uh, plan, specific plan that was referenced has been received by the department. It is uh, being reviewed by the department and engaged with uh, the uh, parties that submitted it uh, to uh, uh, as part of the bigger initiative that uh, my department's uh, undertaking. Member with under five minutes left. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the last part of that answer and I look forward to hearing more. Um, still mystified by the first part. So if it's not, if it was never there, where was it <laughs> and where is it? <laughs> Um, I'm not getting that answer, but I'm I'm not going to spend more time trying. Uh, <clears throat> following the release of the Street Checks report, um, the former Minister of Justice issued a directive, which uh, in turn became a moratorium on Street Checks, which we were pleased to see. Um, there's an exception in the language of that moratorium for police inquiries into suspicious activity. And I know there's been some conversation about whether that does or doesn't reflect a common law standard. This is like a long kind of legal brief kind of conversation. Um, but nonetheless, people are very concerned about it. Uh, our understanding is that the Human Rights Commission has been engaged to review the term. And I'm wondering if the minister can provide an update on that work. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so to the question of, of the human rights, I don't have an update. Uh, that is an independent, uh, although they report through, 
they are independent. I, I'm not aware of the the work that they would be doing on on that uh, piece, uh, so I can't uh, unfortunately provide an update. But I can uh, advise uh, Mr. Chair, you and the, my colleagues, that uh, we are engaged uh, on that very question uh, with uh, DPAD and and organizations again as part of our broad work. And uh, I mean that's a specific item, but all of that falls under our commitment, my mandate uh, to uh, move forward and and uh, address. Uh, these systemic issues and uh, make improvements, uh, and that I assure you, I'm I'm, I'm committed to uh, to doing. Member with about two minutes. Okay, uh, well, I want to thank uh, the minister for um, a four-hour estimate period, which is probably a new low record for him, um, and uh, and for you know for your um, responsiveness and relative brevity. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I recognize that this is a new department. So thank you uh, both to the minister and to the staff uh, for being responsive. And I, I look forward to following up on some of the issues we discussed. But with that, we'll tie up and let the minister make a few remarks and read the resolution. I recognize the minister for closing remarks and presenting the resolution. So Mr. Chair, just uh, so I time this appropriately, uh, what is our closing time? I can unmute uh, 505. So I've got uh, three minutes. I can probably clear my throat uh, and prepare. But uh, suffice to say, before I um, read the, uh, the resolution, I want to first uh, thank uh, my colleagues, uh, everyone who has participated uh, this afternoon uh, with uh, these uh, estimates uh, discussions. I prefer to, to refer them in estimate debate, but, but it really tends to be more discussion um, for those that asked questions, but also those who have sit uh, in on the committee uh, uh, listening. And, and uh, I know uh, the topic of, of justice uh, is important to us and as, as members of the legislature, but also uh, our constituents. Uh, I'd also, uh, again, be remiss if I didn't uh, refer back, as I did in my opening remarks, to uh, thank uh, all of the staff uh, throughout the Department of Justice. I've only been here for uh, a couple of months, uh, but uh, I've been very welcomed. Uh, I feel very welcomed uh, into the department, and I appreciate that um, very much. And I look forward to uh, continuing to work with all of uh, them uh, to implement our budget commitments, uh, but also um, on uh, the other priorities uh, defined in my mandate and uh, ensure uh, we do um, provide justice uh, in a meaningful way to all citizens. And, uh, and also, uh, likewise, appreciation to all of our community partners, uh, service providers and organizations that help us uh, provide uh, true justice uh, to the citizens of Nova Scotia, recognizing we have work to do. And with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, I move that it be uh, resolved uh, um, that a sum not exceeding 392 million 342,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of the Department of Justice pursuant to the estimate. Uh, be it resolved that a sum not exceeding $957,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of the Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Review Office pursuant to the estimate. Be it resolved that a sum not exceeding $2,857,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of the Human Rights Commission pursuant to the estimate. And be it resolved that a sum not exceeding four hundred. $27,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect to the Nova Scotia Police Complaints Commissioner pursuant to the estimate and resolve that a sum not exceeding $26,633,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of the Public Prosecution Service in pursuant to the estimate. And uh, those are all of the resolutions pursuant to the department as well as our partner organizations. Mr. Chair. You're on mute, Mr. Baines. Shall the resolution stand? Stand. The resolution stand. Uh, again, thank you to the minister. Uh, I'm sure you're in shock because this was so short as you're normally accustomed to having a week in the, in the chamber but we appreciate you and your staff being here today. The good news that I mentioned last night, uh, we're down to one more day of estimates and we'll be getting together again on Monday. Uh, don't know what time, 
same place and same station. So everyone have a great weekend and we'll see you on Monday. We stand adjourned. Mr. Chair. No, no, don't. We've got committee of the whole, I think. Don't leave. <laughs>